opening ceremony. Thank you. Dzień dobry. Serdecznie witam na naszej konferencji ICONS. Authorities, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it is a real honor and a joy for me to open this 2022 annual conference of the ICONS Society on Global Problems and Prospects in Public Law. It is a long-awaited uh, appointment uh, after two years of pandemic that have forced us uh, to suspend our annual meeting in person. So welcome all of you to ICON here today. All of you, those who have decided to travel to Wroclaw in order to attend the conference in presence on site despite the challenges of the virus that is still around and has obliged some of our friends and guests to cancel their trip at the very last minute. Let me address them with our warmest wishes from prompt recovery, but also welcome to everybody who for any reason they had will follow us online thanks to the efforts of the organizing team. For the organizer, it has been a double effort for putting in place both on-site and online events. There are many people to thank for this multifaceted organization. So our heartfelt thanks to all the people involved. And let me mention at least the Communication Commission Committee, sorry, the responsible for technology and indeed, a special mention to our local Polish host, Anna Szleginska Simon and Darius Adamski. Please. <laughs> they have worked endlessly with dedication and enthusiasm to make sure that this appointment could happen despite all the difficulties and the countless unexpected hitches. The past two years have been extremely challenging for everybody, and our academic community was no exception. We had to face unfamiliar challenges to which we have responded promptly with resilience and creativity. This community has never interrupted its activities and has even expanded. New national and regional chapters were founded, new type of events have been convened, new blogs and new groups started their activities. New technological support is being put in place and much more. Always in motion, never at rest never at, at rest because it, this is a lively community, or if you want better, a community of lively people. In one of her deep and intense thoughts uh, taken from flights, uh, Olga Tokarczuk says, uh, I quote, standing there on the embankment Staring into the current, uh, I realize uh, that in spite of all the risks involved, uh, a thing in motion will always be better than a thing at rest. That change will always be a nobler thing than permanence. That which is static will degenerate and decay, turn to ash, while that which is in motion is able to last for all eternity. I am not in the capacity of predicting if we will last for eternity, indeed. But I am sure that insofar as we move and change and renovate until the very last minute, as it has happened to our conference today, 
this is a sign that we are alive. So thanks to all the organizers and to the attendees for their flexibility, always ready to adjust to the changes requested for the sake of our common mission. On a personal note, let me add that it is a privilege for me to take some 36 hours pause from my duties and responsibility in the Italian government and to go back to my first and unique love, the academic life, to exchange views, opinions, and to listen to junior and senior scholars engaged in exploring the new frontiers of public law ahead of us in this time of global challenges. Despite my current and pressing engagements, I never stopped following closely our community with empathy and deep admiration. So let me thank Richard Albert, Michaela Elbronner, where is she? Hello? And Sergio Verduga and, uh, Verdugo and Diletta Tega, she's not here for she is sick for discharging also part of my duties for this conference uh, and for always keeping me updated and on board of this wonderful adventure. I look forward to meeting the heart of the society, in particular the many young scholars uh, who are the vital part of this community and constantly animate it. We, the people in government, uh, always need uh, your constructive critique uh, and most relevant, your proposal. So I wish you all a wonderful and fruitful time here in Wroclaw. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, welcome, everyone, to the 2022 annual conference of the International Society of Public Law. This is a moment to celebrate, so let's all clap, please. Welcome, everyone. I want to thank each and every single one of you for making the effort to be here. Many of you have had delays, lost baggage, but we're all here, and that's what is important to mark this landmark event, seated together, exchanging ideas together, fellowshipping together. I like to think of our annual conference as a festival of ideas and action in all areas of public law, from administrative law to constitutional law to international law and far beyond. We'll enjoy ourselves. We're here to launch new books, to make new relationships, to push the boundaries of our current knowledge, and to celebrate great scholarship and impact in the field of public law. And it's right that we're here to celebrate, and we should all do that today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. But as we spend time together this week enjoying ourselves, we must always keep in mind the single most important reason why Icon S exists. The International Society of Public Law exists to advance our mission. And our mission is rooted in the values of public law. We believe in procedural values, transparency, accountability, notice, predictability. We believe in substantive values, equality, fairness, dignity, humanity, and we believe in the power of public law to create a better world through political freedoms, civil liberties, and human rights. All of this in furtherance of the rule of law, constitutionalism, and the protection of minorities. The result of all of this, we hope, is a world of peace, prosperity, fulfillment, and solidarity. The world, I think, needs the icon -S mission today more than ever, perhaps since 1989. That year, as you know, marched 
marked the beginning of a global transformation all across the world. A transformation from closed societies to open societies, from rights infringement to rights enforcement, from the ascendancy of authoritarianism to the ascendancy of democracy. And today we find ourselves at a similar pivotal moment in the history of the world, a moment when we are at risk of losing many of the gains that we made that fateful year, starting in 1989. All around us in the world, we see long-standing institutions of government being eroded, undermined, attacked from within. All around us in the world, we hear political leaders creating false narratives that pit one group versus another, us versus them, resulting in dangerous and divisive fissures in society. And all around us in the world, we're witnessing the decline of trust in democracy, leading to a global recession in democratic values. That's why Icon S is so important today in the world, and that is why we gather every year together. Icon S stands with all who share our mission. We stand in solidarity with everyone who believes in the values of public law, and we pledge to do all we can to advance that mission everywhere in the world we go, starting here in Poland, in Wrocław. So, Welcome to the 2022 annual conference of Icon S. Welcome to this festival of ideas and action in public law. Let us all enjoy ourselves immensely, happily, but let us never lose sight of the reason why we're gathered here together. Let us all lose sight of the mission that brings us all together in defense of the values of public law. Welcome, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, as you see, we welcome you in Wrocław more than warmly, and not especially in this room, but generally it's a very nice weather today. And uh, I'm here on behalf of the mayor of Wrocław, Jacek Sutryk, which uh, send you, dedicate to you a few words. We will see the movie in a few seconds, and then he asked me also to add something from the city, if I may. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wrocław, which is cited most often in the are, I believe, true than ever. This is the start of the new phase of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of uh, this year. More or less 80,000 new citizens in the uh, city. What is a challenge facing our city also brings hope. This hope is uh, brought by people themselves, uh, both earlier residents of Warsaw and those who come here after February 24. Uh, why am I speaking about this in front of uh, such a distinguished group of uh, scientists uh, from around the world? Uh, because I think that uh, when the world um, that is going on beyond our country's eastern border ends, only the uh, rule of law uh, will be able to restore balance to the world system. Uh, and the participants in today's conference uh, will play an important role in it. So, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation to Wrocław. Uh, your presence, especially at this time, is extremely important uh, to us. I greet you from uh, the series of local government meetings uh, devoted to Ukraine. Uh, they prevented me uh, from greeting you um, personally today. Uh, um, and uh, I greet you from the authorities of Lviv, uh, our sister city, which I visited uh, yesterday and uh, today. So, so um, I wish you a good time in our city. May both of the meeting place, as I said, bring you many good conversations and uh, good memories. All the best. Enjoy the conference. Enjoy the city. And see you next time in Warsaw. This is true, we just have back from Lviv. Lviv is our sister city. And we meet the people there, people who are very brave, very strong, and the most important, they are unbroken. They are ready to stay in the city and be with the city and citizen. It was very important travel for us, not only because Lviv is our sister city, but also because of the very important relation. I mention about it because Wrocław and Poland now, it's informal, and I even think the formal 
embassy of Ukraine and the Ukrainian case in Europe and European Union. Let me express in this difficult time two joys. The first is very personal. The personal is, thanks of this conference, I have opportunity to meet in one place, in one time, a lot of my friends and colleagues from European University Institute and other part of the academia. I'm happy to see all of you here. I hope that we will have opportunity to talk. The second joy is more important because the second joy is related to the city. The uh, city of Wrocław is a meeting place, as Mr. Mayor said, but it's also a city which is very responsible about the words. And we are very happy and proud that we can be a host for a people who work with words. We listen a lot of words today and we will listen a lot of them in the next part of the conference. Words are very important and being the faithful to the words which is speaking are even more important. If you will see in the coat of arms of our city, you will find uh, five symbols. I would like to just say about two. One of them is the head of John the Baptist, the biblical person who lost his head because of his words. The second one in John the Evangelist. He had a long life because of his words when he signed in Evangelia. But let me show you the more, uh, the, 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 the cases which are closer to our time. Olga Tukarczuk, you will have opportunity and pleasure to listen to her today, was awarded about her words by the Nobel Prize. But 80 years before, in the German city of Breslau, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German priest, the evangelist, was murdered because of his words by the unlawed regime, regime of the Nazi in this part of Europe. The words are very important, and being the faithful to the words are very important. These words creating the law. I'm very happy and proud, and a little bit stressed, of course, to staying in front of these distinguished people who are working with words every day. But I'm very happy that Wrocław, city of words and city of responsibility, have this noble uh, visitors and guests this day. I wish you a very good time in Wrocław. I wish you a lot of good words in Wrocław. I wish you to meet in Wrocław again, even after the conference. Welcome warmly to Wrocław. Dzień dobry. Dear uh, Professor Katabia, dear Professor Weiler, dear Professor Albert, and dear Deputy President Lorenz, dear participants. It is a May great pleasure to welcome you all to this annual ICON S conference here in Wroclaw dedicated to the topic of global problems and prospects in public law. Until a while ago, they used to say that the term problem was practically non-exist in the fields of politics and diplomacy, or rather, that it was more advisable to talk about challenges rather than problems. Talking about challenges allows you to emphasize not so much to obstacle itself, but the change to overcome it. In other words, to promote a spirit of rising to the occasion. But I have to say that I find the title of this year's conference all the more refreshing. Clearly, eliminating the word problem from the lexicon is not a solution itself, and one would have to wear pretty rose tine glasses not to recognize current public law issues for what they are, problems that are affecting the European Union, its individual member states, and the ties that exist between them. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented us with an almost unprecedented public health crisis. It affects our felt on every level and it has magnified and highlighted several other issues, including the state of democracy and the rule of law. The recovery and resilience plans have, that have recently been submitted to the European Commission indicate willingness to manage and overcome this crisis. When the European Parliament articulates concerns over the recovery and resilience plans, of individual states, we should listen to these concerns, particularly where they involve breaches of European values. I'm thinking of the rule of law, of course, and the independence of the judiciary in particular. This is not about nitpicking and it's not about assigning some kind of homework for the sake of it. The issue is a much more fundamental one, one that affects a very foundation of the European Union. 
to establish long-term cooperation, we need mutual trust between the European Union and its member states. And to arrive at that level of trust, we have to agree on common terms and values. By honoring these terms and values, we also honor the history and the very essence of the European Union. The rule of law is more than just the ornament. It is a key component of the European idea and has to be treated accordingly. The rule of law sets a high standard and we should always ask ourselves whether or not we are doing justice to it. To ensure that we are, a dialogue can be instrumental. Saxony's Ministry of Justice and for Democracy, European Affairs and Gender Equality wants to contribute to this dialogue. This is why earlier this year we hosted the first of what we are hoping will become a series of annual conferences. The idea behind these three national conversations on the rule of law is to promote a mutual understanding about the rule of law and to discuss how it is threatened today. The first of these conferences took place in January in Leipzig and it involved legal practitioners, politicians, as well as academics from Poland, the Czech Republic and Germany. The conversation often turned to the issue of compliance with the rule of law within the EU's member states, but as you can imagine, it drew wider circles from there. We talked about the individual histories of EU member states as well as potential clashes between EU law and national legislation and how these topics are often intertwined. A substantial conversation about the rule of law may not be the easiest conversation to have in Europe right now, but it is one that we need to have nonetheless on a level playing field. I would be very happy if all of you were to become part of this conversation to help us find a common European denominator where the rule of law is concerned. In other words, to rise to the occasion. I wish you all a memorable few days in this wonderful Wroclaw, and I would like to say thank you to, to the presidency of Icon S, not just for hosting your annual conference here, but also for giving me this forum. Thank you very much. Well, it's really great to see you all here. Many of you know that uh, Wrocław was slated to host the 2020 annual conference. Uh, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, it turned out to be impossible. One year later, so last year, when we resumed preparations for this conference, uh, we essentially knew two things about the theme. Uh, the first actually was that um, the original topic for the 2020 conference, and that was populism and the uh, divided societies, unfortunately uh, hadn't lost its relevance in some of the countries in this part of the world but it somewhat had subsided in others. Mm, that was the first thing. The second thing was that uh, we sensed that there are some uh, very powerful, disruptive global processes uh, which either accelerate or are entirely new and which profoundly uh, challenge uh, the role public law has played for decades. Um, the COVID-19, of course, is is, is the first example. The accelerating technological change is another. Um, the climate change, which you unfortunately experience today, the climate change, the water crisis, um, uh, and um, overpopulation, which in fact um, translate into other problems, other challenges like migration. Uh, there are the whole set of new global problems uh, which we encounter. Um, <coughs> we didn't predict some of the new problems, especially this open war against a sovereign European state, which in the name of uh, some very heinous, uh, toxic uh, uh, imperial ideology, that's what we didn't predict, uh, but we knew that uh, there will be new problems, 
new ch challenges. And actually, uh, the implications will depend on how our societies respond to them. Uh, what we've seen recently, I guess, in, uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19, but also the war in Ukraine, is that after the initial periods of um, chaotic unilateral actions, uh, uh, you essentially see that uh, cooperation intended to restore fundamental goods and values tends to uh, prevail. And cooperation always needs rules, which is the domain of ours, the domain of, uh, of lawyers. And therefore, those problems, those challenges can translate also into new prospects um, for law. We're very happy you'll be discussing both the problems and uh, new prospects for public law here for the next three days, both uh, in person and, uh, and online. We wish you very fruitful very productive interaction, interactions. There's been quite a big group of people involved for quite a long time to make it happen. As I represent the local team, please let me start by saying thank you to my colleague from the Faculty uh, of Law Administration and Economics, uh, Anna Śledzińska simon I think I see uh, Anya over there. Yes, that's, that's her. <laughs> Who has contributed? Who has contributed enormous amounts of time and effort um, to the preparations um, of this conference? The team of the convention bureau, with uh, whom you've certainly interacted on your way here, not knowing it, uh, has been extremely professional in taking care of uh, all the organizational, all the technical uh, aspect aspects, as, and so has been the technical team of the law faculty and communications team of the, of the university. The Wrocław municipality has not only provided very generous funding, allowing us to organize this, uh, this event, but it has also uh, supported us uh, organizationally throughout the whole process, and we are very grateful for that. We've received enormous support from uh, ICONES, Richard Albert and Sergio Verdugo, in particular, have, solved, have helped us solve zillions of issues and have been making sure no aspect slips our attention. Thank you for this. So did actually Michaela Heilbronner. Yeah, 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 yeah. They do, they do deserve it, really. Anna Piri has been tremendous supporting us in all communications related matters. Um, Amal Seti and Fred Zomstyle. Um, have been amazing delivering technological solutions. There's been many more people involved, really. Yes, 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 please do this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the organization of, of this event, and I'd like to thank them all. We can meet here and online, um, thanks to the efforts. But even more so, we're here thanks to all of you who will contribute to the panels, both those on-site on here in person and online, and the plenary session sessions. Last but not least, we're here to listen to our keynote speakers. And essentially, at, at that point, I wanted to introduce uh, Professor Ken Leonard, uh, the president of the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union here. Unfortunately, two days ago, I got a phone, phone call from his assistant who told me that uh, President Leonard uh, got high fever. That was the first phone call. Yesterday, I got another one saying that, unfortunately, uh, Professor Leonard is too weak even to connect with us uh, online. And uh, it's a great pity, indeed. Uh, um, essentially, what we can do at this stage is, is only to hope that uh, President Leonard will recover very soon. Uh, but as the saying goes, um, every, cl uh, there is, uh, every cloud has a silver lining, right? Uh, so, uh, we got in touch with Joseph Weiler, who kindly agreed to uh, come to our rescue and take over this very challenging task on such a short notice, uh, which also means that no introduction is necessary because everyone here knows who Joseph Weiler, one of the co-founders of the ICONES is. What I can say for sure is that uh, his uh, talk will be an intellectual feast, that's for sure. 
and I know what I'm, what I'm talking about because we meet quite often and every conversation with Joseph is an intellectual feast. That's one thing. The other thing about this talk, I'm quite sure about it, is that it's going to be provocative. Again, it's every conversation with Joseph Weiler. That's for sure. Now, the title of this uh, keynote speech um, was inspired, I know it, was inspired by the original title of the keynote speech by uh, Kun Leonard. And the original, the, 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 the talk by, by uh, Kun Leonard was on the rule of law and democracy. This, uh, this talk will have a slightly different title. Should I say it, Joseph, or do you want to do this? All right, yeah. So the title of this uh, keynote is um, On the Rule of Lawyers and European Democracy. Joseph Weiler, the floor is yours. Thank you. I apologize that I have to speak sitting down. Don't be in a hurry to get old. And I have to make another apology that I'm speaking all together. It, it's happened to me more than once and I'm sure to many of you. You go to the opera and you're hoping to see Pavarotti or Netrebka. And when you arrive, you get a piece of paper that came from the photocopier two minutes ago. Usually they say indisposed. And in the United States, we say bait and switch. I went to see Pavarotti and, uh, well, I'm not Pavarotti and I'm not Netretko and I'm certainly not Kuhn Lennartz. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, The rule of lawyers, the lawyers I have in mind are judges, including judges of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And I decided to focus on European democracy because usually for some time, and rightly so, when we talk about rule of law and democracy, we think of the problems in some of our member states, including the one we are here, uh, posing challenges to the rule of law and democracy. And we typically think of the European Union as being part of the solution. And we turn to the European Union to be part of the solution. But I'm going to focus on rule of law, rule of lawyers, and European democracy to show that the European Union may be part of the solution, but is also part of the problem. Uh, <coughs> so typically, when we speak about our polities, we think of uh, the holy trinity of liberal democracy. Democracy in the sense of free elections and majoritarian rule and everything that goes with that. Protection of fundamental human rights as a bulwark against the tyranny of the majority and the rule of law. Depending who's speaking, they either say rule of law, democracy, human rights, human rights, rule of law, democracy, but it's always this holy trinity. Now, <coughs> if we think of the European Union, it's interesting in more than one way. Because the European Union did not start celebrating this holy trinity. The first thing that is curious that of the three values, the one that came first was the rule of law. In the famous decisions of the 1960s, Van Handen Los, Costa Enel, direct effect, supremacy, etc. The new legal order, uh, ABC, first year, first semester European law. And what it meant, more than one thing it meant, but one of the things it meant, it meant for the member states to accept the principle of supremacy of European Union law. But if you think about it, it's kind of curious. Because at the time, in the mid-60s, when we had that 
so-called constitutional revolution, consolidating the rule of law as one of the foundations of the European Union, protection of fundamental human rights did not exist in the legal order of the European Union. When the cases came before the ECJ in the late 50s, and people pleaded for the illegality of certain European Union measures, it used to be called the European Communities, the Court of Justice simply said, protection of fundamental human rights is not something that we can do or that we do. It's not one of the criteria that we use when examining the legality of European community measures. So we had the rule of law in the sense of direct effect, supremacy, etc. But within the legal order of the European Union, no protection of fundamental human rights. And we did not have democracy either. The European Parliament was a debating chamber, which had a consultative role. So that you remember there was a famous decision that the Council of Ministers on a proposal of the Commission went ahead and enacted European legislation. And they said, you can't do it without having listening to the European Parliament. So they said, OK, they listened, and then they did what they wanted to do anyway. So we had, at the beginning, just the first of the three values, rule of law. And it's become one of the foundations of the European Union, not only in our member states, of the European Union itself. Without the rule of law, without supremacy, without direct effect, etc., it would be hard, it would be a WTO plus, nothing more. So let's see how it evolved, how eventually the European Union came to embrace the Holy Trinity. And the first to come was protection of fundamental rights. How did that come about? There was no charter. It came about because of supremacy. Once the judges of the European Court of Justice recognize we are asking for a discipline of supremacy or primacy of European Union law over conflicting member state law, how can we ask them to accept that supremacy and primacy if we ourselves do not check for violation of fundamental human rights? So in 1958, they say fundamental human rights doesn't exist. In 1969, in the famous Stauder against the city of Ulm, they suddenly discover, and we are glad they discovered, that actually protection of fundamental human rights were part of the patrimony of the European Union legal order, ex nihili. But an important development. And of course, in the background was already they were hearing about the decision of the German Constitutional Court you remember the famous first Solanga case in Internationale Händelgesellschaft that said, hey, hey guys, if there's no protection of fundamental human rights in the European Union, how do you expect us to accept supremacy? So we already begin to see the nexus between supremacy, rule of law, and protection of fundamental human rights as part of the European Union Holy Trinity. Democracy comes much more slowly because the big turnaround was in 1979. That's almost 30 years after the establishment of the communities, where we have direct elections to the European Parliament, but the European Parliament is still powerless. And we are conflicted on how to think about the governments of the member states in the Council. Why conflicted? On the one hand, we say, well, that gives democratic legitimacy. If all the member states are represented and they have the legitimacy from their own member states, where's the problem of democracy? But it's complicated. It's complicated in two ways. Because a small country like Luxembourg, with the then veto power, could block the collective will of all the other member states. You can see that that's some kind of challenge to democracy, isn't it? So unanimity and the veto power is a complex issue when we think about democracy. But more seriously than that, even if the member states are represented in the council, it's a crass empowerment of the executive branch at the expense of the legislature in the member states. As the competences of the European Union grow, remember we're already in 1979, 
with each increase in the competence of the member states, we have de facto, and in some respects also de jure, a diminution of the powers of national parliaments. And that also complicates the democratic story. And then, step by step, croc po croc, the European Parliament gets more powers. So that eventually, and not so long ago, we can, when the European Parliament becomes a veritable co-legislator with the Council of Ministers, elected by the peoples of Europe, people think, okay, the democracy problem has been solved. Because now we have in the European Union, because now we have rule of law, everybody seems to accept supremacy, direct effect, and all the rest. We have protection of fundamental human rights, including the enactment of the Charter, so now we even have a written Bill of Rights. And finally, we have a European Parliament directly elected, with which is a co-legislature. Now we can start preaching to the rest of the world how to govern themselves, because we are in order. So that's the end of Act One. It seems to be a very good story, and uh, the sky is blue, God's in his heaven, and everything's okay. So now we will move to Act Two to show some of the stresses, the contemporary stresses, on this happy story of the European Union, rule of law, democratic, and protecting fundamental human rights. So, first of all, let's leave a minute, let's go to politics, and let's go to sociology. <coughs> we know that the reality of European integration today is not what it was 30 years ago. Uh, what are the signs of that? Well, there are many signs. I, I will just mention two which are germane to the topic I'm talking about. Which are germane to the topic I'm talking about. The first is that Euroscepticism, now Euroscepticism, I don't mean necessarily exit, like Brexit, but there's a, different there's a different kind of exit. It's, yes, we want to be in the European Union, especi especially when these checks come, but we want a different kind of European Union. All kinds of names are given to it. It won't be the European Union that we know and we have grown up with, and which it has come to be, in my view, a noble experience in human affairs and in international relations. Euroscepticism used to be the privilege of the lunatic fringe on the left and the right, and now it's mainstream. Look, Marine Le Pen has almost 90 deputies in the French Parliament. Uh, and it's not only France, it's all around us. If there were elections, excuse me, uh, Minister Cartabia, uh, if there were elections tomorrow in Italy, it might well end up being a coalition government which is Eurosceptic in some respect, problematic in some respect. And this is, uh, this is Italy. And I can go on giving examples from many other member states. Eurosteticism is mainstream. It's not yet majoritarian everywhere, but it's mainstream. It's normal politics. It's a different community. And the challenges, the pressures on all three of the elements of the Holy Trinity, on democracy, on human rights, on the rule of law. Let's start with the rule of law. I want to go back to the very superficial analysis I gave on supremacy and direct effect a few minutes ago. You recall it's a 1963-1964 story. What is interesting in Costa Enel, which introduced supremacy, is what is not there there's not an appeal to the basic principle of supremacy, pacta sunt servanda, of public international law. That in public international law, you cannot plead 
domestic law as a legitimate excuse for violation of an international treaty violation, an international treaty commitment, I beg your pardon. The court does not base its doctrine of supremacy on straightforward public international law. And for good reason, not only because it had detached itself, it announced a new legal order in which individuals are not just objects but subjects of the law, it gave a different rationale for supremacy, equality before the law. The Advocate General in Van Gendern Law said there can be no supremacy, there can be no direct effect because there's no supremacy. If we introduce direct effect in countries which accept supremacy, individuals would have rights. In countries in which they do not have supremacy, individuals will not have rights. It would violate that basic principle of the rule of law, equality before the law. And therefore, there cannot be direct effect. In Costa NL, the court reversed took the same logic but reversed it. It said, since we have direct effect, we have to have supremacy. Because if we don't have supremacy, there will be inequality before the law. But you note, it's not a public international law reasoning. It's inherent. It's an authentic, original, European law. Because the real revolution, the real nature of the new legal order as distinct from public international law it's not only direct effect, because we know direct effect also from public international law. It's abandoning the principle of state responsibility. Because what is Pacta Sunt Servanda in public international law? I promise to fulfill my commitments, and if I don't, to compensate you. That's how public international law works. Certainly de facto, and maybe even de jure. So I have the option. I sign the treaty. If I violate it, I will have to compensate, pay reparation. My state responsibility will be engaged. It's an option that every state in the international legal order reserves to itself. I will violate my international legal commitment, and I will, my state responsibility will be engaged, and I will pay, make reparation, whatever that may be. That's disappeared from the legal order of the European Union. You do not have that option. That's the real revolution of the new legal order compared to public international law. So now let's go one step further. I always ask my students in every class I give, when was supremacy oof. <laughs> oof. When was supremacy introduced to the European legal order? And always somebody falls into my trap and says, 1964 Costa NL. And then I say, no, supremacy came to European Union law when the constitutional courts of the member states accepted the doctrine. Because if the constitutional courts of the member states did not accept the doctrine, there would be no supremacy. Now, that is a political sociological observation. But now, at least for the legal theorists among you, I will make a provocative statement. In my view, it's not only a sociological political observation that if the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Courts of the Member States were not to accept supremacy, there would be no supremacy. The European Court of Justice would climb the mountain and cry from here till further notice. And it took time. The Conseil d'Etat only in 1989 accepted. I want to make the statement that the real basis of supremacy of European Union law in our European Union derives from the constitutional law of the member states. The constitutional courts which accept supremacy say it's because our constitution tell us to accept supremacy. And that's what gives it teeth, and that's what gives it force of law. And that shows us that at the heart of the legal order, when we are talking about the first value of the Trinity, rule of law, the key players are the courts of the member states and especially the constitutional courts and the supreme courts of the member states. If that weakens, if that disappears, the rule of law within the European Union weakens and disappears. And now, let's go back to where I was before, when I said 
that the three values are under stress. If it was only the Polish Constitutional Court, in Yiddish we say mele, okay. If it was only the Danish Constitutional Court, in English we say we can live with that. But when it's the Danish court, and the Czech court, and the Polish court, and especially the German Constitutional Court, unofficially the Primus Inter Pares, and even the Conseil d'Etat, and I dare to say even the wonderful decision of the Italian Constitutional Court in Tarico, make no mistake, it was elegant, it was ingenious, but it was an iron fist in a velvet glove. What would have happened if the European Court of Justice had replied and said, no, you have to comply with European law? I cannot guarantee that the Italian Constitutional Court would have followed. After all, they defied the International Court of Justice on the issue of sovereign immunity. So when we see one court, two court, three court, four court, five court, and not the usual suspects only, we understand that something is not exactly right in the Kingdom of Denmark. That our accepted knowledge that the rule of law is consolidated and at least that foundation of the European Union legal order is strong, we can no longer say that with the same certainty as we said that before, and I will come back to that in a minute. The same goes for fundamental human rights. Let's say something about that. The problem of fundamental human rights is we have the fundamental human rights protected by the European Union. <coughs> and the European Court of Justice supervises that the European legislator should not violate the fundamental human rights as recognized by the European Union. But what happens, the obvious question, and I'll give you an example. In Germany, for example, if there's a raid, an antitrust raid, to discover if there was an antitrust violation, in order to enter the offices, you need the signature of a judge. In the European Union, it's enough to have the signature of a commissioner. So you could say the German order gives higher protection than the European order. But we all understand that since we are dealing with European Union law, even if there are these differences, we have to accept the European definition of fundamental human rights. So a commissioner, a judge, we can live with that difference. And we have to live with that difference for the same logic. Because if we had different standards, we would compromise, remember, the basic principle of supremacy, which is equality before the law. There would be one right for a German and another right for a Belgian, or for a Pole, or for an Estonian, or for a Maltese. But what happens if this difference in the level of protection is not kind of trivial of the nature I just said, does it have to be signed by a judge or can it be signed by a commissioner? But it goes to something that the constitutional order of the member state considers fundamental, like in Tariko. They said what we are talking about here is fundamental to our legal order. You know who also said the same thing? Guess. The European Court of Justice itself, in the famous Cadi decision. Pacta sunt servanda. Pacta sunt servanda means states have to observe Decisions, binding decisions of the Security Council. And the European Court of Justice, perhaps a titre juste, said we understand that, but the principle involved here is so fundamental to the legal order of the European Union that we cannot follow the Security Council. And we will disobey it. I'm giving you to show that there are, not every right is the same. Some rights, a constitutional order can determine this for us is too fundamental. And have sympathy for the domestic constitutional court judges. It's not that the European court can say, frog, we have to jump. 
now again a provocative statement. The ultimate loyalty of a constitutional law judge is to the constitution of his or her member state. But it's more than that. The very foundation, as I argued before, and I know not everybody agrees with me, the very foundation of the supremacy of European Union law comes from the constitutional orders of the member state. So it's a really pregnant problem. Now, the solution <coughs> is uh, not easy. Uh, the Italian Constitutional Court in Frontini said, if there were to be a conflict between rights protected by our Constitution and the European Union, there are three options. Either we change European Union law, or we change our Constitution, or we leave the European Union. You know who said exactly the same thing, almost word for word? The Polish Constitutional Court in 2005, in their similar decision. But we realize that that's pretty drastic, isn't it? So we have a problem. And now it's under pressure. And democracy, well, I'll tell you how to identify the pressure on democracy. <coughs> what is the rallying cry of Euroscepticism, of so-called populism? Although I don't like the word populism, because when you don't like it, you say it's populist. When you like it, you say it's popular. So. What is the rallying cry of populist? It was the rallying cry of Brexit, but it, you can hear different tonalities of that in other member states. It's taking back control. In other words, it's not the usual explanation, although it has values that people have become Eurosceptical because of material things, the unequal distribution of the deserts of globalization. It's certainly a factor, but there's a feeling we've lost control. We are not in charge of our destiny as we are meant to be in a democratic society. Where's the democratic legitimacy of the legal order of the European Union, which exercised such extensive public power? End of Act Two. Act Two was trying to say that nice image, we finally got to the promised land, we protect fundamental rights, we have democracy, and we have the rule lo of law in the European Union, is under stress. So now, in Act 3, I want to be a little bit more analytical and try and think of both reasons and solutions. And here I take my <coughs> cue from Lampedusa in that wonderful novel, The Leopard, where he famously said, if you want to keep things as they are, you have to change everything. And since we now are facing a conference for the future of Europe, and finally the member states have recognized that there will have to be treaty amendments, it's worth talking about what are the changes that are necessary in order to keep the European Union as we know it today in its fundamentals. You have to change a lot to keep the core. So let's go back again to courts, to this kind of judicial rebellion, the uh, Ortega y Gasset. I want to talk first about, there are two issues where we cannot just say frog, jump. One is intravirus, ultravirus. Here's another trick question I ask my students. Define for me the principle of primacy or supremacy of European Union law, and almost always there's somebody who falls into the trap and says European Union law is supreme over conflicting member state law. Wrong. The correct formulation is European Union law is supreme in the sphere of application of European Union law. If the European Union acts outside its sphere of application, it is not supreme. That's the correct formulation of the principle of supremacy or privacy, which immediately beg begs the question of who gets to decide if it's ultra virus, intra virus. 
Now, from a legal and pragmatic point of view, there can be what one on there can be but one answer. The European Court of Justice, excuse me, you can see my age, the Court of Justice of the European Union. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. I afraid to say. And why has it to be the European, the Court of Justice of the European Union? First of all, because that's what the treaty says. And secondly, because if every member state court, if every supreme or constitutional court of a member state would get to decide what is ultra virus, intra virus, we back to square one. One law for the Germans and another law for the French. One law for the Poles and another law for the Italians. That cannot be. It cannot be intra virus in Italy and ultra virus in Poland. From a pragmatic, functional point of view. But for that to work, there have to be some conditions. The first, there has to be trust by the National Constitutional Court and Supreme Courts that the European Court of Justice is an effective federal policeman of the jurisdictional lines of the European Union. Now, let me say something about that. <coughs> and I'm sure Kuhn Lennartz, if he sat here, he would do be doing this. But that's why I have tenure. <sighs> For many years, the European Court worked under the ethos of Pierre Saint Pierre, Pierre Pescator, which we are the guardians of the treaty. We have to protect the treaty against anybody who's trying to compromise it. And first and foremost are the governments of the member states. And in addition to that, and I must say that in the evolution of the European Union, we have to be grateful to them. When the political process is blocked, we, the court, have to step in. That's how we got direct effect and supremacy and all the rest. You know something? that really worked for the 60s and 70s and maybe 80s. It doesn't work today. I think today there has to be a different conception of what it means to be a guardian of the treaties. The guardian of the treaties should be we are the impartial adjudicator in conflicts between the member states and the European Union, especially on the issue of ultra virus, intra virus. And I don't think the Court of Justice of the European Union has great credibility in that respect. I'll give you one example. I could give many others. Take a very important concept, European citizenship. You remember, it came in, in Maastricht, ma nationals of the member states are citizens of the European Union subject to all the rights and duties. And they never mentioned duties, but all the rights specified here under. Then, in the next intergovernmental conference, there was a backlash. So it was amended. And now it read something like, from memory, I don't call my memory anymore memory, forgettery. Uh, nationals of the member states are citizens of the European Union. European Union citizenship is supplementary to member state nationality. In other words, don't get ahead of yourself. The core identity is national citizenship. The supplementary one is European citizenship. Now we go to the Court of Justice in cases like Zambrano and others, the whole line of citizenship cases. And suddenly we read the following. European citizenship is destined to be the fundamental status of individuals in the Europe. Where does that come from? It's contra legem. It's exactly the opposite sense of how the treaties were drafted and then redrafted. It's pescatorianism. It's good for the 60s and 70s. It's not good for the climate now. 
So the first thing I'm saying is it's a change in the institutional instinct of the European Court of Justice, still guardian of the treaties, but has to credibly position itself as an impartial adjudicator in conflicts not between member state A and the union, member state B and the union, but the whole concept of the balance between member states and the European Union. If we think of vice, let alone the decision of the Polish Constitutional Court, from a legal point of view, vice was an aberration. It was the silliest case you could make the point that when it comes to inter vires, member state courts reserve the right to be the ultimate arbiter. But it's and it's been criticized ad tedium ad nauseam, and correctly so. But let's ask ourselves, we know the judges on the German Constitutional Court. They know idiots. They knew what they were doing. It's precisely the legal weakness of that decision that shows that it was a protest decision. It was not a technical decision about proportionality in decision of the European Central Bank. It was shooting over the bows and maybe even shooting into the bows of the European Court of Justice. We want to send you a message. The status quo cannot go on. You really have to take much more seriously the issue of intra virus, ultra virus. And if you don't do it, this is what we will be doing. That's how I understand vice. So the first thing I said was there has to be a change in the institutional ethos of the Court of Justice. These things don't happen overnight. So the second thing, and I will be brief, because I don't want to be too self-referential. So you might know that Daniel Sarimiento and I made a suggestion if we get to an intergovernmental conference and a rewriting of the treaty, to create a new chamber in the European Court of Justice. Not a Bennett, not a new court. A new chamber in the European Court of Justice, which will decide on intra virus, ultra virus issues. And what will distinguish it are three things. First of all, its composition. It will be in our proposal, but of course the details the lawyers can argue over and ad, ad nauseum. Six judges from the European Court of Justice and six sitting judges from national constitutional or Supreme Courts. And they could rotate, they could be assigned. In other words, the people who will be deciding the case will be judges with the internalization of European integration, but those who also can see constitutional law as a sitting judge in a national constitutional court. The president we proposed would be the president of the European Court of Justice, unless he himself or she herself was sitting in the decision which is contested. And then it could be one of the vice presidents. The second thing is that in our proposal, you would need at least nine judges to decide that a contested measure is intra virus. In other words, reverse the presumption. Not, and that's the third innovation, if in doubt, ultra virus. Not if in doubt, intra virus. And we think this is a correction. Does it solve all the problems? If you go to the blogs, you will see that not everybody was happy with this. But I'm saying, come up with a better solution. Because what is important here is it's the European Court of Justice which is deciding intra virus, ultra virus, not a national court. And the likelihood that national courts will then deviate from that decision is not eliminated, but is lowered. The same thing could apply also to human rights. When a national court says, this is not just a conflict of standards, here you are touching, ala tariko, on something which is essential to our understanding of our legal order, again, it could be decided 
by that particular chamber with that kind of composition, with that kind of sensibility. Would it solve the problem? Definitively not. Will it reduce the possibility of conflict, etc.? Probably yes. So I get to democracy. <coughs> so, you know, I wrote, that's the second and final self-referential thing. The first book I wrote and published, I wish I could eliminate it from my CV. I know, now you're going to run and read it, don't. It's a <laughs> pretty bad read. You remember in 1979, first direct elections to the European Parliament, and we were all very disappointed, those of us who were alive then, huh? we were all very disappointed because the turnout of voters was very low compared to national elections. And then, with uh, an arrogance then, which is even greater than my arrogance now, I wrote, why are we surprised? The European Parliament has absolutely no powers. Why should people bother to go and vote for them? They're voting for a debating chamber, not for a decisional chamber. The people are not stupid. And then I predicted, you will see, as the European Parliament gets more powers, voter turnout will increase. The exact opposite happened. From one IGC to another IGC, the European Parliament got more power. So that in this one, it was really a veritable co-legislator with the Council. And from one European election to the next European election, less and less people went to vote. Now remember, we just agreed a minute ago, we're not Belt or Brecht. The people disappointed, let's change the people. We said the people are smart, they know what they're doing. Why have less and less people gone and voted for the European Parliament, even as the European Parliament got more powers? In the last election, there was a slightly, slight uptake. Eurosceptics, protest vote, if you see who they voted for. Why did this happen? Because we lived under a misconception about the democratic structure of the European Union. We thought the solution to the democracy deficit was simply giving power to the European Parliament. It's a misunderstanding of how democracy works. We have different systems. Poland is different from Germany. Germany is different from Spain. Spain is different from Latvia. But there are two primitive principles that exist everywhere. One is what the Brits say, you can throw the scoundrels out. I have a decisive say by whom I will be governed. In some countries, I get to elect my next prime minister. In other countries, I am decisive in the coalition that will choose that prime minister. But I have a say, and if I don't like him or her, in the next election I can vote otherwise, and they're out. That doesn't exist in the European Union. Voters to the European Parliament, as we saw dramatically, and I have full respect for Madame van der Leyen, but she was not elected by the European peoples. They had a different candidate. She was selected by Mr. Macron and Ms. Merkel. And then the other member states said, Amen. Not by the peoples in their vote to the European Parliament. They hadn't even heard of her. We don't get to elect by whom we will be governed. And the second primitive principle of democracy is, if there is, it's called voter preference. If there's a majority who vote center-left, there will be center-left politics. If there's a majority who vote center-right, there will be center-right politics. There's no s not a single study that shows a connection between the politics adopted by the European Union and voter preference in elections to the European Union. So it shouldn't surprise us that people are not showing up at elections to the European Parliament if they don't get to do those two primitive things. Decide who will govern them and decide what direction the politics of the governance will be. 
that too has to change. Because we don't only have a democracy deficit in an abstract way, we have also a political deficit. Politics without politics cannot be democratic. Politics without choice cannot be democratic. Politics where we, the electorate, we this, and speaking as a European citizen, do not in some small way get to determine the composition and the direction that our governors take. That choice is politics. That choice is democracy. That too needs to be fixed. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And congratulations on your excellent but clear, clear exposition of the subject. Some lecturers I know of um, explain simple things in a complicated way. You explain the complicated matter in a relatively simple way. Um, I'm Tonio Borsch from the University of Malta, a former European Commissioner. And from my experience in the Commission, I realized that one of the reasons, one of the reasons, why there is this lack of credibility and trust in the EU, apart from those which you mentioned, is that it is very convenient that at once something is successful, that is because of the member states. When it does not work, that is Brussels. So if we make European all that fails, and we nationalize everything which is successful, then it is not surprising that we have the results we, we have as regards voter participation, etc. Um, this reminds me of what JFK said after the Bay of Pigs. Victory has many fathers, but defeat is an orphan. The second point, I was also a cabinet minister in Malta and uh, minister of interior at the height of the immigration crisis, which influenced the peripheral states, mostly in the central Mediterranean, Italy, Malta, and Greece. And there I felt, along with my Italian colleagues and Greek colleagues, that there was this idea, this is the peripheral, immigration is a problem of the peripheral states. So it is not an EU problem. So what started to happen was that with Schengen, the immigrants who were released could go without any checks to France, to Germany, and to others. Then according to the Dublin 1 and 2, if, if caught, they are sent back to Greece, Italy, and Malta. They are released again, and this human ping pong in eternity continues. So, there was this lack of trust in the EU institutions that immigration was not being tackled seriously, and as a result, what you said happened, that not only the extreme fringes started being Eurosceptic, but even the mainstream parties have part of their policy. Thank God not all, part of their policy is Eurosceptic. These are my views. Thank you very much. 
Uh, can you repeat the question? No, no, I'm yeah. teasing. I'm it's teasing. Well. I'm teasing. <laughs> I, I just want to. If make you give me the opportunity, yes. <laughs> I want to make a comment on your first comment. When uh, it's a success, it's the member states. When it's a failure, it's the, pro the fault of Brussels. But I hear that also in Brussels. When it's a success, it's us, the union. When it's a failure, it's the fault of the member states. But there's something deeper uh, in operation here. Not for years, for decades, the legitimacy of the European construct, and this was part of the ethos of the Commission of the European Union, was the legitimacy of results. We even see it now, if we look at the agenda for the Conference of the Future of Europe, we have to give the people what they want. Uh, more employment, more security, more prosperity, more internet, all very important things. The Romans had a name for that, bread and circus. It, legitimacy of results is bread and circus. Because it depends, if you provide the bread and you provide the circus, the people will love you. The minute you don't, you lose your legitimacy. What has been lacking, and that was the burden of my last point, it's the essential of legitimacy of process. It's not just the results that are delivered. But the process, the input legitimacy, not just the output legitimacy, where people understand we elected this government, we favored this policy, it didn't work. We can't just point fingers at others. We also, that's what democracy means. We also share in the responsibility. So your comment just strengthens my last point and we might agree to disagree. After all, we're in a university where at least for now that still prevails, uh, that one of the changes that has to come in is taking more seriously process legitimacy, input legitimacy, and not just success and output legitimacy. Whether Brussels blames the member states or the member states blame, blame Brussels. But otherwise, I thank you very much for your comments. I was told in the meantime, uh, your lunch is actually ready, uh, but what I suggest is that we can still accommodate for two questions. Please be brief. If there are any, if there is anyone who'd like to ask it. And oh yeah. Thank you, Professor Weiler, for such a wonderful uh, and very uh, wider perspective for the history of the European Union, the competence, uh, ultra villas, etc. And I have two questions. Do you think that it's quite like necessary for the European Union now to access the European Convention for Human Rights? Because it will give more legitimacy also to the European Union, which is somehow under not under control of anybody from the point of view of fundamental rights. They should not be constitutional courts, but rather the court for human rights in Strasbourg who will give this legitimacy. And my uh, second observation is that do you think that fundamental rights, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, should be applied in all situations, not only in, within the scope of the application of the EU law, because it is just uh, inexplicable to the citizens that, for example, the right to the dignity can be protected by the European Union, but only within the situation when we apply European Union law. It's very unjust and some constitutional courts like Croatian one see it uh, declaring that if we accepted the European Union, we are bound by the values uh, protected by the European Charter. So perhaps in some fields there should be more uh, European Union law in the field of the fundamental rights and the, from the other point of view, the control of the Court of Human Rights. Thank you. It's a little bit easier for me to answer the second question, and I know good people and true can disagree with this. Let me start with an example. You look at the German constitution, you look at the American constitution. <coughs> they both protect freedom of expression. Freedom to protest, freedom of expression. 
they both liberal democracy, they still, they both uh, committed to protection of fundamental human rights under their constitutions. But they uh, interpret them very differently. The understanding of freedom of expression in the United States means that the Supreme Court will protect the right for a bunch of neo-Nazis to march with swastika flags through Skokie, a neighborhood of Jewish survivors, and they say that's freedom of expression. We're very sorry, we have to protect it. In Germany, where freedom of expression is also protected, if they just took one step in that direction, they would find themselves in prison. A different understanding of protecting freedom of expression. Both of them legitimate. Both of them understandable in terms of historical context. So we see that different societies can have different conceptions of how to interpret the balance between a public good and an individual liberty. United States is driven by liberty, Europe is driven by dignity. That's a little bit superficial, but there's some truth in it. And they decide differently of that issue. So I see no problem if outside the sphere of application of European Union law, different member states will have different levels of protection of fundamental human rights, given different historical contexts, different composition of society, etc. In fact, I'd almost celebrate that. So I don't find it anomalous that within, because we see that also in mature federal states, that in the sphere of application of federal law, there will be one type of protection. Outside, there would be another type of protection. I d for me, it doesn't offend me. It doesn't, I don't see that as chaos. I see that as rich, as, uh, remember, united in our diversity. I'm not sure I understood the first question. Was it, should the Union join the European Convention on Human Rights? Well, I was disappointed by the decision of the European Court of Justice. Look, they negotiated this, tr this treaty for years and years and years. In, already in 1978 was the first proposal that the European Union join the European Convention on Human Rights. It's anomalous. It's a requirement for a new member state to enter the European Union to be a member of the European Convention on Human Rights. And yet the European Union itself is not a member de, de jure of the European Convention on Human Rights. Grant me that it's anomalous. So they negotiate this treaty and uh, the legal service of the Commission says it's kosher. The legal service of the Council Member state says it's kosher. The legal service of parliament says it's kosher. But the European Court of Justice decides it's not kosher for this or that reason. I didn't find the reasoning all that convincing, but I, I can see it. It's not a panacea, because in some way, the European Convention on Human Rights is our lowest common deno denominator. It's our safety net of protection of fundamental human rights. It doesn't prevent the European Union having uh, different or more extensive or uh, uh, higher level of protection. So m my regret is not that I think that fundamental human rights in the European Union would be better protected. And I certainly would not like to see that all of us, the European Union and the member states of the European Union, slide down to the safety net of the European Convention on Human Rights. It's more an aesthetic thing to me, a legal aesthetic. It's the British officer. Don't do what I do, do what I tell you to do. You have to join the convention, but we can stay without it. I also have, with many decisions, especially church and state, I have some problems with the protection of fundamental human rights offered by Luxembourg, where I think Strasbourg offers better protection on issues of church and state. But you know good people and true can also disagree on that. Yeah. And the last question. Thank you very much, Professor. Oreste Bollicino, Bocconi University. Uh, Oreste from Bocconi University. I was uh, in 2001 in Bruges uh, and uh, your student, by the way, at College of Europe, and I was, I was totally enlightened by the 
concept of uh, principle of constitutional tolerance, that at the end is exactly what you're explaining, that the primacy is not uh, in cost annual, but when member state had the court accepted. But this was uh, a totally different era. There was not the enlargement, there was not the window populism, there was not the narrative of bad master uh, uh, um, uh, identity base coming from Kashru. If you would have written that, uh, let's say, inspiring uh, article now, which would be, according to you, the, uh, the way in which should be fostered the constitutional tolerance today in Europe, especially by the Court of Justice. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's easy for you to hear, but the I'm not sure I understood the question. No, basically, my point is the following. Uh, I remember when in uh, uh, 2001, the idea of constitutional tolerance, it was very clear. It was the acceptation in the name of European peoples, where the S made the difference. It was a totally different era from the actual one. Why? That, that part I understood. I yeah. didn't understand the question. Okay. The question is the following. Today, with a totally different context, with the enlargement, the wind of populism, the idea of bad masters coming from Kashrue with the uh, identity-based approach. You would have written the same, uh, uh, let's say, approach, or according to you now, which would be the element to foster this constitutional tolerance in a different era, in a different season? Should be the same ingredients, or should be something more coming from Luxembourg? You know what my difficulty is? And I'm not joking, I say this with almost tears in my eyes. I have to really, really think hard what I wrote and what I thought in 2001. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> whether I would write exactly the same thing or not. But I would say I still believe in the concept of constitutional tolerance, which w one manifestation of that is that the authority of European Union law ultimately comes from the constitutional orders of the member states and depends on that. And it's simply, as you say, more challenging because when all this happened, there were six member states, nine member states, even 12 member states, but much more homogeneous, etc. We now are 27 with different sensibilities, different histories, etc. I think the principle still applies, but it also imposes a duty on the judges of... I spoke on how the European Court of Justice should change its institutional ethos. But this is also for the judges of national constitutional and supreme courts. You can't say, our constitution decides this differently, that's the end of the game. It really has to be something fundamental. You can't use identity, constitutional identity, as an excuse for every little difference between how Europe decides and how we decide. The slightest difference, we cannot accept supremacy. That's nonsense. The kind of conflict we are seeing should really be reserved to truly fundamental differences, a la tariko, where you can really say, this is at the heart of our constitutional order. We cannot simply say, okay, we give it up because we're in Europe. And I think one of the trends that was happening, and this is one of the negative aspects of vice, that they took such a trivial issue and made it into a big constitutional identity issue. That's what was so weak about their decision, and that's why I said we have to take it as a protest. But there's a duty of the, on the European Court of Justice to rethink its orientation. There's also a duty on the Constitutional Court of the Member States to rethink, and the way to rethink it is in a Kantian way. What would the European Union look like if every Constitutional Court behaved and decided the way I decide today? It's a kind of categorical imperative. I should only do this if I would be comfortable that every other constitutional court would decide in the same way. If I cannot say that to myself, I should be reluctant to break line. There's a constitutional right to lunch. 